Happy Mother's Day, moms, and also, mom, I know you're watching. I love you. Happy Mother's Day. And uh, for all of you mothers of young children, especially for those of you who uh, at the beginning of this year had a New Year's resolution to spend more time with your young kids, well, I guess you got it this year, didn't you? So happy Mother's Day to all you moms. Before I begin, I just would love just to uh, pray over you moms. Let's pray. Hey, Father, I thank you so much for our moms and and the sacrifice that they've made for us. They've made physical sacrifices. They've made financial sacrifices. They've made uh, time sacrifices. And all of that's just born out of their love for us. And I thank you so much, Lord, that you've given us uh, beautiful women in our lives to care for us, to nurture us, to persevere uh, with us, Lord. And I pray that you just continue to to strengthen them and encourage them in the work that you have called them to in, in raising their children, whether they're young or the influence that they have, even having adult uh, children as well. And Father, I thank you so much that uh, through the blood sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, that you have blessed mamas uh, with the opportunity of eternal life for their kids through your son, Jesus Christ. And I thank you so much for that provision um, as well, Lord. And Father, I thank you so much that you love us tremendously. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. So this morning we're finishing up on our series called Little C, where we're rethinking the church. Uh, if before we kind of kind of get into this, I'd like to kind of go back a few steps and get a little bit of a running start to what we're going to be talking about today. If you if you recall, if you've been around with us uh, at the very beginning, if you haven't, this would be a great opportunity for you to kind of uh, click in with us. We kind of started off this series asking, why did God make the church? Why this thing called the church. And there was a reason behind that. If you recall, this was kind of the reason here where it says, you know, God created humanity where humanity was created for a relationship with God and one another to represent God to the world. In other words, when God created us, he created us to have a relationship with him and not only to have a relationship with him, but to be an influence out into the world. But because unfortunately, because as, as us as humanity, we are often can be selfish and self-centered. And so we wanted to do things our own way. Instead of really loving God well and loving other people well, we decided we wanted to love ourselves well. And that created a, a lot of brokenness in our world. And not only that, but through that, we also didn't really represent God very well through that either. And so that is why God sent his son, Jesus Christ, not only to sacrifice his life, to reconcile us, to bring us back into a relationship with him, uh, but also so that through that, we can also be a representative of his through into this world. So God, through his son, Jesus Christ, is bringing us back into a relationship with him and with one another also so that we can be as a people, uh, people who represent God to the world of who he really is. And then we talked about what exactly is the church? How is the church really supposed to function? And so we kind of gave you a little definition of what the church is. And the church really is just simply a family gathering together with God. And that's it. You know, Jesus said, where two or more are gathered together, uh, I'm with them. And so what we see that even when there are two or, or more brothers or sisters together with their heavenly father in the mix of that, then that's church. Whether that's just a couple of people with God or that's with thousands and thousands and thousands of people with God. That's what church is. It's just simply a family gathering together with God. And so Caleb last week talked about how do we as a, as a family, how are we to, to gather? Because oftentimes in our lives, uh, we as a, as a people and as a family, uh, we can be messy, right? Families can be a little messy. We can be a little bit off in, in some ways. And so what, we, what he taught us last week is how do we go about bringing about restoration with our relationships as a family, how we do life together as a family so we can be healthy Particularly, we become healthy when our Father, our Heavenly Father, is right in the mix, in the middle of our relationships together. And so what I want us to do today for the rest of the time that I have with you is to really kind of hone in on that last little bit of that phrase where we are to represent God into the world. So the question then is, is how do we represent God? How are we to do that? Well, one of the first things I want to talk about is how we don't do that. Okay, so one of the things that we don't do when it comes to God is this is that God is not looking for the world to love the church. Sometimes we think that it's our job to get people to love the church, to love us. And sometimes we even have a shadow mission within us because we want other people to love us. And so what we try to do is we try to be the ones who are attractive. We want people to think that we're great. We want people to think that our church is the best. We want people to think that our people are amazing, that our programs are incredible. 
And so we can have this, this, this shadow mission within us that it really makes it all about us. But there's a problem when that happens, okay? When we try to get the world to, to love us, a couple of things happen. First of all, we get spiritual pride. We think we're better than other people. Or we feel shame that maybe we're not as good as other people. And all that kind of junk that begins to happen when we make it about us. The other thing, too, is when we try to make it about us, you know, what happens is, is that we also can create a confusion when it comes to people about us. Like, for instance, I heard a man once say this. He said, what you reach people with is what you reach them to. In other words, if all we are is about us, then all we do is reach people to us. If all we do is try to reach people with, with great technology, with great messages, with great music, with great programs, if that's our goal is to reach people to that, you know what's going to happen? That's what we're going to reach them to. That's why Kayla was talking about last week that sometimes some of us can grow up going to church and we can go to church every single week and never really have an intimate relationship with God. You know why? Because church became all about the church. It became all about the programs. It became all about us. And somewhere along the line, we crowded out God. And so, for instance, uh, Paul wrote a letter to a group of churches in Galatia. And he says right, right off the bat there, he says, you guys, I'm shocked how quickly you have turned away from God. And really, if you were to read that, you would sit there and you go, well, wait a minute. I think we're really turning into God because we're being more religious. We're doing all the things that we're supposed to do. We're, doing, we're obeying everything. But Paul says, wait a minute. You've actually turned away from God doing those. What do you mean? How does that happen? It's like any time that we turn away from God and make religion number one, make us number one, try to make other people like us, what we end up doing inadvertently is crowding out God. So when it comes to us representing God in the world, what it does not mean is that we try to get people to think that we are amazing and we are incredible. It just creates all much, so much junk with us and confusion out into our culture. But this is what it means to represent God in this world. See, our Father, see, it's not even really God. See, God can just be kind of this religious uh, uh, thing out there. But when we think about the way God wants us to do life together, he wants us to do life together in the sense of being family, that he's our father. And so our father is looking for what? His family, not just some nonprofit organization, not some kind of club. That's not what we're supposed to be. He's really looking to his family to do what? It's to love the world. That's what it means to represent our father into this world, that we gather together and relate together as a family who goes into this world and loves this world deeply. If you kind of think about it this way, what are two things that you would absolutely love to see in the life of your kids? Probably at least these two might hit your radar. I think, I think it would really wow you if your children just respectfully loved you dearly and deeply. That would be very meaningful to you, wouldn't it? And also, I bet it really makes your heart just uh, beat louder when you see your children be kind and thoughtful just on their own initiative as they go and they love other people. That would be huge for you, wouldn't it? Well, that's what it means to represent God into this world, that we are people that just respectfully love him, that we adore him, that we honor him. And not only that, we take the initiative to go and to love other people the way that he's loved us. That's what it means. That's what our father's looking for. He's looking for not a nonprofit organization, not what we kind of think of as a church with all its programs and everything. He's really looking for a family to not be self-centered and all be all about itself and for the world to be attracted to that church. Really, what he's looking for is us to go and to love the world. And how we go and love the world best is by being a people that doesn't bring people to us, but to bring people to where the real beauty lies, to where the real greatness lies, where the real goodness lies. And that is to Jesus Christ and to our Lord and Father as well. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that kind of illustrates this idea here. We're going to go and we're going to jump to Luke chapter 5. So if you have your Bible there, why don't you flip over there to Luke chapter 5. Uh, if you have a device around you, you can just open up whatever Bible app you have and just turn over to Luke chapter 5. I'm going to be reading through the NLT, so uh, that way sometimes it's easier to kind of match what you're viewing online to what I'm speaking to, so that way it just makes it more seamless. Here, so let me give you a little bit of backdrop of what's going on here. In Luke, 
at the beginning here in Luke chapter 5, what we see is that Jesus' ministry is beginning to take off. He's incredibly popular now. Um, he is an incredible speaker that people have heard him speak and they realize that he doesn't speak like other people speak. Now, you got to understand, during this culture, this is the Greco-Roman world that had vast influence even in the Jewish world, where being an orator, being a communicator was, uh, was a big deal. All the celebrities knew how to speak and speak well. But here is somebody who's like Jesus, who doesn't just speak like those people who can speak well. He speaks differently. In fact, what scripture says is that Jesus speaks with authority, that he's not just presenting something. He's speaking truth into the lives of other people. That really resonates with a, with a lot of people, but it also kind of rubs some certain people a little bit the wrong way, particularly religious leaders. And so we see a little bit of clash in that. But not only that, but it says there, in Luke chapter 5, that Jesus was just doing amazing miracles all over the place. That here was this, this guy who's doing things that were just blowing people's minds. Things that nobody's ever experienced or seen before in their life. And so people were just attracted to that. And so they wanted to be around this miracle worker and hope to see something amazing and something pretty cool. So when we get into this little piece here, I want you to notice that there are three types of people here. Three types of people that, and in fact, when you read throughout scripture, there tends to be almost this three types of group of people that hang around Jesus. One, there's this religious group. These are the religious celebrities. These are the, the people who have um, a lot of theological background. These are the ones who are, who are constantly listening to any type of uh, theological or error from, you know, coming out of whatever somebody is saying. So you have that group. They're kind of, they can be very self-righteous and, and they can be very narrowly focused on just that idea of making sure somebody's right or calling out everybody who's wrong. So there's that group of people that we're going to meet. Then there's going to be another group, the rubberneckers. They're the ones who come and consume. They're the ones who are coming to kind of see the show. They've heard about this guy, and so they're all kind of crowding in to see if they can't get a look at this guy who's not only doing amazing things, but in, you know, speaking incredible things. But he's also very popular. And we just, by nature, are, are people who just love to clamor around popular, famous people. And that's what's happening with Jesus. And, there's, there's a, and then there's a third group. And it's a very small group. The first two groups, probably a larger group. There's a third group that's, that's a lot smaller. And these are the people who have compassion. These are the people who have love for the brokenhearted and the, and the broken. And these are the people who um, understand that Jesus Christ is the solution to the brokenness and the hurt of the people that are in their lives. All right? So now that you're with me, um, what we're going to see here, uh, beginning in Luke uh, 5, beginning in verse 18, there's going to be some guys here. And so there's some men here, and they came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. Um, Mark also writes about this whole incident, and he says that there were four guys. gives a little bit more detail. So there's four guys coming, and they're carrying this paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. And you can imagine how heavy that, that must be for those guys. That these men are getting a, a man who cannot walk, and so all his weight is on that mat. And so they're carrying this man, and they're carrying him all the way to find Jesus. Because there's a couple of things here that you see here. One is you see that these guys really love this man, that they're willing to do all that hard, back-breaking work to get this man all the way to Jesus. Which is the second thing, is that they realize within Jesus that Jesus can do something for the man that they, they care deeply about. And so they take this guy, they take him all the way to where they hear Jesus is. And so they get there. And so they try to take him inside this house. So Jesus is inside and the house is completely jammed packed. And inside the house right now, there's really kind of two group, two of those groups of people in there. There are the, the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious leaders, they're the, the religious think tank, if you will. And they're, what you see through scriptures, these guys always had the prominent seats. So they're the first ones in with the, the prime seats to hear this guy, Jesus. And then and the, behind them are a whole bunch of people crowded in to get a look at or to hear from Jesus. They're the rubberneckers. They're the ones who come to see the show. And then there's the third group. And these are the guys who are trying to get their friend right there in front of Jesus so Jesus can do something into his life. And so they try to go get in, but you know what? They can't. They can't reach him because of the crowd. 
Now, this is very important because sometimes we can inadvertently be people who keep people from coming to Jesus Christ for a couple of reasons. And really, you see it in these two people groups that are inside the house. Sometimes we can keep people from coming to Christ because we are so focused on being right and how other people are being wrong. And we're so focused in and on ourselves about, you know, our own religiosity, about our own, you know, what we can get out of things and, and so on and so forth. And then there's the other group, which is they're the rubbernakers. They're the consumers. They're not even really paying attention to the needs of anybody else because they're really only paying attention to themselves and what they can get out of this whole experience of being with Jesus. And so these two people groups are, are crowding out a man who is broken, a man who needs to see Christ. There's nobody, it's almost amazing that there's, there's nobody here who sit there and go, hey, there's a, there's a paralyzed man. Maybe, maybe we should kind of move out of the way and allow this man to come in and to come and see Jesus. And sometimes I think that even as a, as a, as a church, sometimes we can be so focused on, on looking good and being perfect and doing all the right things and wanting other people to think that we are cool and we're amazing, we're awesome, that sometimes we don't want some of the messy, broken people among us. And so we crowd them out. And obviously that doesn't represent our father very well, does it? But what you see here, really the heart of Christ is that he desires for this man to come before him. But this is what I love about these four guys, though. These four guys didn't just sit there and come all this way and go, well, you know what, at least we tried. You know, this, or they didn't go, well, this is just too hard. This is too difficult. Um, this is never going to happen. And they just kind of lose heart and they go home. Mm -mm, that's not what they do. They love this man so much, they're willing to do whatever it takes for this guy to meet Christ and to come into his presence and be at his feet, whatever it takes. And so we see this. So they went up to the roof. You ever try to carry a human being to the roof of a house? I can't imagine. That would be incredibly difficult. But they did it, whatever it would take, because they got a plan. They figured out a workaround. Instead of just going, well, I guess these people are getting away. I guess this just didn't just work out. No, 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 no. All right, let's figure this thing out. We're going to get this guy to Christ. So they go up into the roof and then they took off some tiles. Now, if you go back into antiquity, they had these, these roofs, and these roofs were really thick in order for the rain not to come in. They're about two feet thick of just dirt, straw, sticks, wood, whatever you can find in order to, to make it strong and sturdy and keep out the rain. So they're digging. They're digging for quite a while to get, you know, uh, uh, room enough for a human being to be lowered down into the presence of Jesus Christ. And you can imagine the people, the Pharisees and the scribes sitting there and all of a sudden the dirt just starting to hit their face as they're listening to Jesus. And you can imagine Jesus speaking these things and all of a sudden all this dirt starts coming in. Now sometimes we can sit there and think, well, what a distraction. I can't believe that these four guys would distract an amazing message that they're hearing. I can't believe that these four guys are distracting an, an incredible, you know, gathering of, of religious people to hear from God. But here, here it is, all the dirt coming in. And so they come, they, they, they make that hole, and then these four men, they lower the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Now I'll tell you what Jesus didn't do. Jesus doesn't go on and just say, wait a minute, you guys just messed up a really great message of mine. I can't believe that you're just a big distraction to me. You, you could have waited until afterwards, until we're all done here, after I give my great message here. That's not what Jesus does at all. Look what he says in the very next verse, in verse 20. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, young man, your sins are forgiven. Now, there's, there's a lot in this verse that I want to kind of, kind of look at here. Well, first of all, it doesn't just say seeing his faith. This is what's really beautiful about, you know, what it means for us to represent our God in this world. He says, seeing their faith, that Jesus said to the young man, your sins are forgiven. Jesus recognized that it was of the faith of these four men and their love for their fellow brother here to bring him into the presence, into his presence. And so when we think about how we are to represent God in the world, it's not just about me individually or about you individually. It's about us being a family. We do this together. And sometimes we do it like these four guys physically where we take somebody and we, we bring them. Or sometimes we, we just are together in spirit, as Paul would say to the churches. I may not be there physically, but I am with you in spirit. That we as a family, we represent our Father together, whether we are together here in the same room or whether we are separated, whether we're at work, whether we're out in the community. We're all in this thing together to bring the hurt, the broken, the distance, the far, close 
to Christ. And so Jesus says to this young man, your sins are forgiven, which is really kind of interesting because one of the first things that you see about Jesus here is Jesus didn't heal him. I mean, the guy is still paralyzed after he says this thing. He's still on his mat. He still can't walk. So what Jesus is really doing here is, first of all, he's taking care of his most important need. Sometimes we feel like our most important need is our felt need, our physical needs, or financial needs. Really what Jesus is really kind of speaking into is, hey, before anything else, your really biggest need that you really need is a relationship with me. Really what is the biggest longing in your heart is your longing of heart for, for to, to connect with a God who loves you deeply and dearly. And so Jesus goes, hey, your sins are forgiven. We're reconnected here in that. And so what we see, though, in verse 21 is something a little bit different, though. But the Pharisees, all right, so the Pharisees are looking at this. This guy is paralyzed. These guys did whatever it takes to, to bring this man in front of Jesus so Jesus could do something to help this man. They were very compassionate about this, this man. And Jesus shows his compassion back to this man there. And, but the Pharisees, though, all they can think about is, wait a minute, that just seems very wrong. This doesn't compute in the way that we look at Scripture and the way that things line up the way that we think it should line up. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law said to themselves, who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Now, technically, they are absolutely right. Only God can forgive sins. But here's the thing. Sometimes we can be, at so, we can be so right that we can actually be very wrong. And that's what happens oftentimes when we are people that are all about being right and that we get a sense of self-significance of being right or we think that we're being righteous when we're right and calling out when everybody's wrong because what they forgot to notice or forgot to have is any kind of compassion. That Jesus has been speaking for some time now and he's been doing miracles in, in many ways by which a lot of people who are hurt emotionally, spiritually, and physically have been healed by this man. And all they can sit there is, is, is like they, they just totally miss that there is a, a really hurt, broken man in front of them. And all they were concerned about is, well, wait a minute. Does that compute to what, what we think of what Scripture says? But not only that, but what we see with Jesus in all of his ministry, the reason why Jesus did miracles and why he spoke the way that he did was to tip people off as he fulfilled all of Scripture that came before him, is that he truly is God incarnate, that before them was God. Now, if they were to step back and just a little bit and listen a little bit and, and slow to pass judgment and to see what he's doing in the compassion that's happening around them, they might have seen something a little bit different in that. And so in verse 22, Jesus knew what they were thinking. He knew what they were thinking. They, he knew the, what was going on in their mind. And so he asked them, and this is what Jesus does a lot. He, Jesus loves to ask questions. But when Jesus asks questions, he asks questions that, that go to the head and through the head straight to the heart. It's always to the heart is where Jesus' final target is. And so he says, why do you question this in your hearts? In other words, Jesus understands what their motives are. And he also understands that they're missing why he's doing and what he's doing and who he is and missing, missing ultimately the compassion um, that, he does, that, that Jesus is showing and the compassion that God is showing. And so these Pharisees and religious leaders are missing that. Can we do that today in our own age? Can we as the people of God, as a church, totally get so amped up on being right and how other people are wrong and we completely miss being compassionate towards other people? You bet we can. In fact, it's, a, it's part of our own flesh nature that we struggle with that. There were struggles of that even in the early church. There was a time when the Apostle Paul was meeting with a group of people from the church of Ephesus. And he basically was telling them this was the last time he was meeting them. You can go check out Acts 20 if you want to go kind of look at that. But anyways, he's basically saying, guys, this is the last time we're going to talk together. But here's the deal. Since I'm not going to be with you any time longer, there are going to be people who are going to come in here and they're going to try to speak all sorts of false falsehoods. They're going to try to trip you up. They're going to try to uh, steer you wrong. So pay attention to what you have been taught. Um, and so what we see from the church of Ephesus, they did that. They did exactly what Paul told them to do. But the problem was they became so zealous of that. They became distracted from God through all of that. Do you know why God wants us to know scripture so well? Is so that we can love him well and we can love other people well. 
He's always the final target in everything that we do. But when scripture and being right becomes the target, or when we become the target, then things begin to change. And we see that. In fact, after, Jesus, after Paul had um, left the, the Ephesians and he went on his missionary journey, and then ultimately after he, even after he died, that Jesus came and, and, and spoke to the apostle John and basically said, I want you to send this message to the church of Ephesus. And so this is what he says in Revelation chapter 2 about the church of Ephesus here, beginning with verse 2 and then 3. And, and so this is Jesus talking to the church in Ephesus. I know all the things you do. I've seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. So in other words, they did exactly what Paul told them to do. They work hard, they patient endurance, they don't tolerate evil people, they examine everything, they kick people out who are liars and that sort of stuff, and they're patiently suffering for, for God uh, without quitting. But here's the thing that would happen with, with this church in Ephesus. They became consumed about this stuff. Their focus was hard work. Their focus was on being religious. Their focus was on, on examining those people who, who got it wrong. They were focused on being strong people who suffered for the Lord. But becoming so focused on those things, they became distracted. And, their, and in their distraction, their hearts begin to move away from the Lord. Because this is what Jesus said to them. He said, but this is, I have a complaint against you. And this is my complaint. Yeah, you do all of those things, but you become distracted with the most important things because you don't love me or, or each other as you do first. And that's what it really means to represent God into this world, is that we are a people that, that, that our Father is in the middle of that relationship that we have together as a family. And as a family, we go out and we love other people well. We study Scripture well in order to learn how to love well. We gather together to encourage each other in order for us to go and, and love well. These are all the things that God desires for us to do in order to, like I said, to go and to love well. That's how we represent our Father in that. So anyways, going back to Luke chapter 5. So what we see here is that Jesus then posed a question to the religious leaders to begin to continue to get them to think about what's going on here. So back in Luke chapter 5, verse 23, Jesus asked a question that I would love, I would have loved to have been there to hear him say this. He asked them this question, hey, religious leaders, is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? What do you think it is? Probably it's your sins are forgiven, right? That's pretty easy. It's not so easy to say stand up and walk. So I'm sure they're thinking the same thing. Well, it's probably easier to say your sins are forgiven. But Jesus makes a point here, and he goes on in verse 24, and he says, here, so I'll prove to you, so I'll prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to, earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man, and he said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. I love that because just as easy it was for him to say your sins are forgiven, it was easy for him to say, get up, take up your mat and go home. So what Jesus is really communicating to these guys is this. Hey, you know, it, from a human standpoint, it's a lot easier to say uh, your sins are forgiven. But to show you the authority that I have, that God has given me to forgive sins, to bring people back into reconciliation and restored relationship with their God, that brings about joy and wholeness and peace. Not only that, but I'm going to show you that I can do that by healing this man. And so Jesus heals him. And so what we see, though, is the response of that man, which is in verse 25. And immediately as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat, and went home praising God. This was the result of four guys who, who were willing to pick up their friend, to, to bring him all that way into the presence of Jesus, even if when there were barriers to that, to barriers to entry, they found any and every way they possibly can to get him to Jesus Christ and put him right in the front of him. And what we see is the life change that happened to that man by bringing him into the presence of Jesus himself. Guys, one of the, one of the biggest travesties and the worst things is not so much that, that someone is lost, 
What's worse than someone being lost is that nobody cares to go looking for them. That's our job. That's what we do. That's how we represent our Father. That we are the people who care to go out and find those who are lost. To go and find those who are stuck, maybe spiritually. That maybe they, they don't even know how to make a movement towards Christ. But it's our job as ambassadors, as Caleb said earlier, as family members of our God, as people who are called to go out and to love people, to go and love and bring them to our Lord Jesus Christ, to bring them to his feet. Again, we're not bringing people to our feet. I can't change anyone. You can't change anyone. The church can't change anyone, but Jesus Christ can. And so as we kind of finish up this series here, this Little C Rethinking Church, I want us to rethink the way that we go about representing of our Father, not as religious, do-right people who think we're better than other people, not about just self-centered consumers of what we can get out of this, but really family members with our Father in the middle of this, where our Father is looking for his family to love the world. Let's pray. Father, we confess to you first and foremost that oftentimes we do not represent you well into this world, that we can be self-centered, we can be selfish, we can be self-righteous, all of these things that can be a hindrance. And God, we just recognize that. We just kind of put that before you. And we ask you that you would just continue to work in our hearts to remind us. It isn't about us. It's not about our club. It's not about our church. It's all about you. You are the only one that really matters. You are the one who changes our lives and you're the only one who changes other people's lives. And if you use us to change other people's lives, then we are just sharing that joy and that goodness of seeing somebody come into your presence and know you and love you. Let us be people, Lord, that are willing to carry the weight and the burden of the lostness and the hurt and the brokenness of another person. Let us be a people that are willing to go around, to go up, to go down, to go wherever it may take to bring somebody into your presence, God. Because, God, what we see is lives change, people praising you and honoring you and glorifying you. God, for many of us, that's our story too. And so, Father, I pray that we would be a people who continue to speak that story through our lives in the way that we love others. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen.